in general. In general. They frankly hate they, they, they are, are never, never consistent. consistent. They, don't they don't mean anything. anything. It's, it's not death. death. It's, it's near death. death. Whatever, Whatever happens, happens in the brain is happening in the brain. brain. And, and if there, if there was, was a God, God that wanted, wanted to show, show people something when they, when they get close, close to death, death that's, that's so stupid. That, that, that even makes the divine in his argument worse. I have to cut off circulation for a certain period of time before you're willing to let me see heaven or hell. And if I... Who wants atheist, Mr. Atheist, you and I have something we totally agree on. I see eye to eye you I, I see eye to eye with you, Brandon, mind shift. This is an instance of you of you being mind shift, not mind shit. I agree. Near the experiences are for me the great Illusion, the great disappointment. Bullshit. I'm angry. I'm angry at near death experiences. If they're really from God, if they're really spiritual experiences, each near death experience will contribute to the other near death experiences. The former growing and bigger, ever growing bigger picture of the big picture. But what the hell do we see? Utter and absolute confusion and contradiction. And God is not the author of confusion. So these near death experiences, ha <laughs> I bitterly laugh at them. I mock them. I I curse them. Unfortunately, back in nineteen eighty six, it is near death experiences that helped me with the death anxiety. I'm terrified of dying. Even though I believe in Jesus, I'm a Christian. I'm terrified of it. How do I know Jesus is really real? It's death to end. I'd rather burn in hell forever and ever and ever and be conscious than die and cease to exist. Now that will change once I hit those flames. I change my mind instantly. But right now when I'm in my real mind, I want to just, I don't want to die. It's terrifying. And the near death experiences are putridly, woefully, stu stupid. I've so disillusioned, especially with Dr. George G. Rich's near death experience. I read his book, Return from the Moral, and it was so beautiful. His near death experiences seemed to transcend human boundaries. Human wisdom. But then I learned, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. Return from the Morrow was a collaboration between Elizabeth Sherrill. She was a fundamentalist, fundamentalist Christian. Dr. George C. Ritchie was a sort of hybrid between New Age and Christianity. I, t I spoke to him on the phone. And that's another thing. Those who've had near-death experiences. I've actually spoken on the phone with, with two of them. I met one face-to-face. -face, and all three of them failed me putridly to show me love. Dr. George C. Richard III, Howard Storm, and Don Piper. All three of them miserably and putridly failed them, failed me. They're, they're supposed to have an inside track to Jesus Christ. And two of them say this Jesus Christ is all love. How Storm and Dr. George G. Richie were as cold to me as a morgue slab. Dr. George G. Richie said the re the, his, his first book returned from the morrow. Elizabeth Sherrill twisted this George D. Rich's words to fit a fundamentalist theology. He said, if you want to know what really happened, you got to read my book, my book, Order to Return My Life After Dying. And after reading My Life After Dying, the way his experience really happened, I was so underwhelmed. The narration sucks. Return from tomorrow creates a vivid 
picture of reality after death. In one scene, people are uh, begging, others trying to communicate with the living. Following the, those who uh, the loved one behind, these people who died, and they were still attached to their loved ones, trying to communicate with the loved ones, unable to do so. And in return to from Mar, he states, "Is this what death is? To be permanently invisible to the living, yet permanently wrapped up in their affairs?" But it was so very different from the way I I had already always imagined death. I watched one woman following a man down the street. She seemed very much alive, agitated, and tearful, except the man who, to whom she was addressing her emphatic words was totally oblivious to exist, his existence. Marjorie makes too many demands on you. You're, why, why aren't you wearing the scarf over and over and over to ears I can, would not turn and listen, listen to her? speak in another factory some workers were gathered around the canteen one of them lit a cigarette and one of the dead people who was there that could not, not be seen asked her for a cigarette begged her as though she wanted it more than anything in her life but the one who was smoking the cigarette totally ignored her of course because the person who was asking for the cigarette was a dead spirit and didn't realize she was dead. She tried fast as a, a stocky snake. The dead person snatch, tried to snatch the cigarette, but her arms went through the cigarette. Over and over again, she snatched at the cigarette, unable to grasp it. And there was more, much more chill. This. This book provided me with an immense sense of comfort, especially when he met Jesus, the love, and when he saw heaven. This made a profound impact upon me. Before, before I read this, read this near this experience, I didn't care about the love of God. I just wanted to get to heaven. I just, want, I just, didn't, I just wanted to get out of hell. But after I read this book, I was profoundly influenced and moved and addicted to the love of God. And to come to find out that it was all bullshit. Oh, in the order to return Jesus, Jesus was loving. But it was somehow the way he described the love of Jesus was not the same way that Elizabeth Cheryl twisted his words to write it in her book, hers and his book, Return from the Mall. Howard Storm. I contacted it. Okay, I found his number in the preface that said he was a pastor of a church in Cincinnati, Ohio, Zion United, Zion United Church of Christ. So I just called, dialed 411, got his hold of the church. I spoke to Howard Storm on the phone. He was just as cold as a morgue slab on the phone. Oh, he, he was the first one I contacted. I asked him. I uh, said, Dr. George G. Ritchie had written the preface on his book. I asked Dr. Howard Storm, what is, his no what is his number? And he gave me his number. I can't believe it. But both men were cold as a morgue slab. I felt like I was talking to a morgue slab. Let me give you an illustration. And I con I, when I was in the 10th grade, I contacted a Unitarian Universalist preacher. And I was asking him some questions. Trying to tell him why I thought Jesus was God. You know what he said to me? Does, well, does your religion produce fruits? I'm like, yes. He answered me. Because by their fruits ye shall know them. And he hung up on me. Howard Storm and Dr. George G. Richard were just like that. In fact, after I called... The second time after I called Dr. George G. Richie, he changed his number. And I had to dial 411 to get his new number. And after that, he changed his number and the number was unlisted. And yet he says in his book, he experienced a profound loneliness when he was dead. 
before he met the Christ. And this produced a deep change in, in him. Now he loved. Now, 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 when he talked to other people, it was a sense of wonder. Why hadn't he noticed this before? But evidently his dove, his love for human, humankind that was given to him by Jesus ran out of the gas before it got to me. So I don't believe he met the Jesus Christ. I believe he met a demon. Or maybe it was a, a figment of his own imagination. It wasn't real, except in his own fucking mind. Same thing with Howard Storm. Near death experiences. They, they had more, a person who was having a near death experience, and he was meeting Jesus with a doctor and administered a drug, and all of a sudden Jesus disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> Some Jesus, it, uh, uh, an injection of a drug can make this Jesus disappear. Some Jesus. <laughs> it's all a crap of shit. And now I'm left with my crippling, paralyzing, death anxiety. All I can do now is party and live it up and be selfish because the more I die, so what? So what? So what? So fucking what? So what? Do good deeds for others? What's the fucking point if good is not, if it's not going to last forever? What's the fucking point? I might as well eat, drink, and be merry. And get all I can and can all I can. Get all I can and can all I get. Hold on, let me do that right. Get all I can and can all I get. Hold on, let me do that right. God damn it. And I don't get all I can and can all I, get all I can and can all I get and I don't give a fuck. Why well, care about other people? There's no such thing as love. Not real love. When people are willing to help other people until those other people are so needy that they constantly call them for help. Then they start to get weary. And when they see you coming, they run the other way. Uh, Self-sacrifice only goes so far. Necessity is more powerful than loving your fellow man. It is necessary to sometimes hang, uh, take the phone off the hook when people desperately need to talk to you so you can get some fucking peace of mind and rest. Necessity overcomes love. Love is not the most powerful force in the world. Necessity is. And our own selfishness is. People are born selfish. Yes, it feels so good to do something for others because it makes my universe a brighter universe. If it didn't make me feel good about myself, I wouldn't give a shit about helping someone else. As a little kid, I didn't care about helping other people. I learned to enjoy helping other people. It was not an inborn trait. It makes my world brighter, and that's why I do it. And you love, you can't love others unless you love yourself. If you don't love yourself, you're not going to love others because it's not going to make you feel good to make someone else a better person. That's a, that, that's a, Mike makes right, survive a little fittest, bitch. Just as long as I'm happy. I want everybody else to be happy. Yeah, I want everybody. Else. Yeah, I want everybody else to be happy because that may because every when everybody's happy, I live in a happy world. But God damn it, if everybody else is happy and I'm not, I, I'm not happy. Fuck that shit. Fuck that shit. I'll steal. I'll cheat to be happy. The number one goal of being alive is to be happy, to complete, fulfilled. Even if you love God, you don't love God for God alone. You love God because God is light, love, life. Without God, you got none of the above. You only love God because he makes your world a brighter world. He fills that inner void. If you did not do any of the above, you'd write God off too. Even, 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 even the world's best Christian would do so. 
That's just the way it is. This world is a shit world. This reality is shit. I didn't have to be born into this fucking world. Well, I'm glad I was. I didn't have to be born a beta male. I Can I give this life back and come back as a alpha male? A good looking top notch, good looking guy? With every... With my personality intact. I want to keep my personality and my uh, distinct taste. But can I give the rest of that... The rest of this life back? I don't like this shitty hand I was given. Can I swap it for a better hand? God damn. Fuck God damn. Right now. Look, looking in my face. I look like a man. I do not look like a college boy. I curse God. I'll go so... I swear by the word of God, the Holy Ghost is not the the, the Holy Ghost is of the devil. If I look like a man, and not a boy, a good-looking boy, I invoke the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost too. I curse the Holy Ghost if I look like a man and not a boy. If I do not look young, if I do not become a good-looking guy, I curse the Holy Ghost. I curse the Holy Ghost. If I'm not good looking and I don't have the long forms. And no, I, I curse the Holy Ghost if I don't get more views in my videos and my songs do not come in the top 40. I curse God. Now, I don't want to curse God. But if I'm not going to get what makes me happy, God can go fuck himself. But near death experience, sis, shit. That shit, I'm disgusted with him. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. Don Piper failed me. He had the 90 minutes in, minutes in heaven near to this prince. I I came up to him crying. I was, I was seeing face to face someone who had seen that there was life after death when you die. And I told him I had some things I wanted to talk to him, but can he give me his personal email? Not his public email, because so, I wanted to talk to him. He's like, sure. He even uh, asked me before I left, All right, and you're going to email me, right? I'm like, yes. Is that your personal email? He's like, yes. Well, guess what? The email he gave me, I emailed him. Guess what? It was his fucking business email he gives everybody. He, where, he goes, where he goes to give speeches, it was his business email. He, 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 I, 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 that was in 2013. Here it is, 2024. I'm still waiting for his fucking response. The motherfucker lied to me. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I guess some people are such a nuisance that you can't help them. You can't, you can't help some people because it requires too much sac sac self sacrifice on your part because they are so much of a nuisance. So they just write you off. You're not any, you're not a member of their family. You're not anyone important to them. So for all they, so for all you care, let them, let them die and God sort them out. You don't love them. Why waste your time with somebody who is a noose, who, who is a nuisance, who is not special to you? There is no such thing as unconditional selfless love. All love is, all love has its, all love has its, all love has as its foundation selfishness. You only love others because you love yourself. That's the name of that tune. Now, I curse God if I do not look good, look good. If I do not become a good looking guy, I curse the Holy Ghost. Cut off circulation for a certain period of time before you're willing to let me see heaven or hell. And if I do and can get myself back by medical intervention, which you had nothing to do with, that's okay with you. The best I can understand is that we have this DMT in our body. A small amount gets released at death. It probably happens when our body thinks it's about to die. People trip. They see all kinds of stuff. It's influenced from what is in their subconscious, from their upbringing and their culture. So of course it looks meaningful and specific and they come back. They have this story. It's impactful. I get it. And people talk about, oh, what they say on their deathbed. But it's also confirmation bias. They're only talking about the ones that say like, Jesus. They don't talk about the person that says ladybug because they're out of their mind on pain meds. You know what I mean? So I don't buy into it at all. And I've looked at it a lot. I just think that there are better explanations and that when you follow the logic all the way down the well, it only leads to worse answers. What's the reason behind your YouTuber name? 